In the fall of 2021, Thinkers Lodge, in partnership with the Center for Local Prosperity, are bringing together 30 leading voices from both the nuclear and climate crises for deep and brave conversations in an environment of intergenerational partnership. This summit examines the two major existential threats for humanity in our current age. In 1955, Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell drafted a manifesto for nuclear scientists to gather to discuss curbing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In 1957, the very first anti-nuclear meeting was held at the historic Thinker's Lodge in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. That pugwash movement continues today. The climate change issue, what we're confronting, it's impossible. It is beyond us. But then on the other hand, throughout history, the most interesting things have been in those moments in history when a people decided to do the impossible. And that's what we need to do now. And that's what we will do now. I'm Robert Cervelli, Executive Director of Center for Local Prosperity. Welcome. Today's one hour webinar discussion, bringing global realities into the classroom. This is the last of a three part series of one hour webinar discussions leading up to the Thinkers Lodge Summit for Nuclear and Climate Crisis, which is happening at the Thinkers Lodge in Pugwash, Nova Scotia at the end of this month and into early October. We've gathered 24 thinkers internationally and regionally, both virtual and on-site, who are, have strong backgrounds in the nuclear arena and in the climate crisis arena to really talk about those two existential threats to humanity that we now face today. The Thinker's Lodge is the place for a gathering like this. It has the history, it has the potency, it has the power behind it. It's a national historic site. Uh, it was given a Nobel Peace Prize along with Joseph Rotblat, uh, who really coordinated one of the first international conferences in 1957 on stemming nuclear proliferation, nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, so that site is, an, is a uh, Parks Canada National Historic Site today. That's where we'll be holding this summit um, uh, for this type of a gathering. We've had two earlier webinar interviews with thinkers that are attending. Those are posted on our website. Please go and check those out. There's also three feature interview articles uh, with some of the other thinkers. So you'll get to know who's going to be attending and you'll get to see some of the thought process as we produce output from the thinkers' discussions during the summit. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about bringing these realities into the classroom. And how do you educate younger generations about the predicaments that we face today? I have the great honor of speaking today with three of those thinkers who are professors, educators, authors, actively involved in teaching. And we have interestingly experience at all three levels of the undergraduate, graduate students, and even mid-career professionals involved in the military. Uh, firstly, at the uh, undergraduate level, Dr. Adam Fennick, He's presently the director of the University of Prince Edward Island's Climate Research Lab that conducts research on the vulnerability impacts and adaptation to climate change. He teaches and manages one of the first undergraduate programs for climate change science. There, he and his students developed CLIVE, a virtual reality depiction of sea level rise, which has won international awards during uh, including one from MIT for communicating close coastal science. 
Adam shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He's taught at the University of Toronto, as well as the Smithsonian Institute for over 20 years. And he lectures regularly at universities across Canada and around the world. Secondly, we have Dr. Mitchell Wallerstein. He's Professor Emeritus at Baruch College of the University of the City University of New York, and is now appointed as a university professor at City University of New York. He teaches graduate level courses at the Mark School of Business and International Affairs at Baruch College on international security and the liberal world order and on the policy implications of global climate change. He was appointed as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for counter proliferation policy and senior defense representation for trade security policy. He's responsible for formulating US defense policy to counter nuclear, biological and chemical weapons proliferation, as well as national security export controls. And he helped to found and subsequently co-chaired the senior defense group on proliferation at NATO. And finally, we're also honored to have Dr. Walter Dorn, a professor of defense studies at the Royal Military College of Canada and the Canadian Forces College. He teaches officers of rank major to brigadier general from Canada and about 20 other countries. He specializes in arms control, peace operations, just war theory, international criminal law, treaty verification and enforcement, and the United Nations. As an operational professor, he participates in field missions and assists international organizations. Walter previously served as chair of the Canadian Pugwash Group, and he seeks to promote international peace and security through teaching, research, and service. We have about one hour for open discussion. You're welcome to put your questions into the question box, and I will do my best to work these into the conversation as we proceed. So I would like to open our discussion with some questions, and I'm gonna throw it out there to all three of you at once. You're in the classroom, you're at universities, different types, both Canada and the US. We're in the middle of a planetary crisis, climate change all over the headlines, increasingly so on a daily basis, it seems these days. The nuclear weapons threat, um, are we coming into a new cold war with what's going on in China and North Korea, Iran and so on? Uh, tensions geopolitically building in different parts of the world. Those seems to be the overarching issues of the day, at least in terms of the health of civilization and the future of humanity. So the real question becomes, how much of this percolates into the classroom, into the average university? You're probably plugged in with a number of different universities, colleagues across North America, if not the world. So that's at a high level. How much of these topics really come down into the classroom? Not just from the work you're doing, but more broadly. What's your sense for that? I'll throw it out to any one of you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll have a stab at that question. Um, both the, the potential for a new Cold War and for and of climate change are issues that are existential to humanity. And uh, it's only natural that they're, they're covered in a course. I, teach security courses, and we look at the range of security threats. Um, it is ironic that we use the term cold and warm or hotter. I mean, we're talking about a new cold war as the planet warms. Um, and uh, in my view, 
the only way you can solve one problem is with the help of the other. That is, I think that you need to be able to uh, deal with the nuclear threat, transfer billions of dollars, trillions of dollars that are used on um, defense related things to help create the kind of ingenuity and capacity needed to solve some of the other threats to humanity. So they're, they're linked in that way. In the classroom, obviously, uh, since I teach military officers, they uh, are considering both, but um, they're also linked in the sense that these are global problems that require global solutions. And with the risk of proliferation, with the risk of uh, increasing of China's arsenal from 320 or so uh, nuclear warheads to uh, get in the direction of the uh, main uh, nuclear warhead stockpilers, which is Russia and the United States, um, we have these new threats and uh, we have to pay very careful attention that, in fact, we don't create a new Cold War. Um, those of us who live through the Cold War don't want to have the uh, nuclear sword of Democles hanging over our head, knowing that uh, at any moment it could come down with the increasing risks of uh, nu loose nukes. Uh, for instance, in Pakistan, after the debacle in Afghanistan, that um, we could have a de destabilizing in the Southern Asia continent. So yeah, it's both really important subjects and uh, are tied in various ways of which I've just mentioned a couple. Yeah, interesting uh, uh, comparison. Cold war on a gloaming on a warming planet. <laughs> yeah. Thought about it that way, and, and certainly can appreciate the monetary resources being diverted into one at the expense of the other. And um, how, yes, related in that it seems like we're, if anything, need more cooperation internationally as opposed to tension. Uh, Mitchell Adam, um, your thoughts about the presence of these topics in universities today? Yeah, I think that the uh, certainly the climate issue is one that uh, people now see all around them. Uh, I mean, this summer certainly has been uh, provided shocking evidence of uh, how rapidly the climate is changing with the fires out west, both in the U.S. and Canada, and uh, the uh, the storms, the very you know, more frequent, more intense storms, flooding, not only in North America, but in Europe as well. Uh, so uh, I think from the students that I teach, which are, who are graduate students, um, are well aware of these factors and uh, realize that the, this isn't a, a crisis that they're going to have to confront probably throughout their adult lives. Uh, it's a long-term problem. I think they're somewhat less aware of the nuclear problem uh, it's something, of course, uh, they were born uh, in the nuclear age and uh, didn't have uh, the experience that some of us on this webinar did of duck and cover drills and, uh, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis and so forth. So they may be less aware of that. Uh, somewhat curiously, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that if you look at the relationship just between the United States and the Russian Federation, uh, we are at a low ebb in terms of uh, arms control agreements, nuclear arms control agreements. Only START II is the only uh, strategic arms agreement that is now in force. Even the Open Skies Treaty has been abrogated by both the United States and Russia. So, uh, you know, it, it is a dangerous time, but I'm not prepared to say we're about to enter a new Cold War. The Cold War was an ideological struggle. Uh, the struggle that we are appear to be engaged with the Chinese uh, is more of an economic uh, struggle. Of course, there's the issue of Taiwan, but uh, uh, but to, which is not to say that the Chinese don't potentially rep uh, represent a threat. <clears throat> there's evidence that they are expanding their strategic missile force. I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I have to agree a lot with uh, with you, Mitch, in terms of the students and their focus more on something that to them is a lot more tangible and is not so hidden. Um, the, the students that uh, I engage with, and primarily undergraduate students, they do have this um, 
the sort of um, shallow knowledge of climate change, uh, as well as a as a lived experience of climate change that's in the news, but also in some places here in southern Canada, where they're actually seeing the uh, the impacts, the the gross impacts of of climate change. The the nuclear threat is um, doesn't come up and. Even trying to explain that odd situation of an ideological uh, 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 discussion between capitalism and communism uh, is it usually brings a, about um, blank stares. And the idea that we, you know, that we're still trying to deal at this point with like a dominant ideology. Um, you know, back in my day in the university, every department, well, almost every department, had a, uh, a communist uh, uh, professor who could bring that perspective to thought. Um, it, it's really lost on our students of today that there is anything beyond the dominant ideology within w which we live. And I think that's perhaps might be some of the reason why there's not that much discussion about uh, the nuclear threat. Now, Adam, you helped put together the School for Climate Change and Adaptation at University of Prince Edward Island. Is that um, one of the first schools specifically focused on climate change, or do you know of others? It, it certainly is the one that had the first Bachelor of Science in climate change and adaptation. Um, you know, we do have these grand lists of all the programs around the world that are being in existence. There were a lot of climate change uh, graduate programs that have been in existence for quite some time now, um, but it was the first undergraduate um, Bachelor of Science in climate change and adaptation. And it's, you know, it attracts a lot of, uh, a lot of students and it also, you know, attract a lot of uh, others who are are building other universities who are who are creating their own undergraduate programs now, you know, places, uh, you know, right across the country and around the world. So, uh, you know, the demand is there, you know, we, we will be uh, collectively graduating a whole army of, uh, of students, undergraduate students who have the skills necessary for understanding climate change and for you know having to live with it how to how to adapt to it um uh, but yeah we were we were the first you know that you've raised a question of how uh do we live with it um and students wanting to know that you know you know mitch you mentioned the uh what was it duck and cover exercises way back in the 1960s 1970s somewhere in there you know 60s 50s and 60s, and people were building bomb shelters, and they had Geiger counters and the whole thing. I don't think I ever had to duck under my desk. I remember some of that, though. Um, and it was very visible. It was front and center uh, in the media, you know, uh, public safety officials, everybody was really out there with it. But now it's almost kept under the rug. It's almost as though governments prefer that we don't know. And I say that specifically, one of our other thinkers, who's a youth out of Cape Breton University, uh, was interviewed and she said that comment, that it's almost as if with the nuclear issue that governments prefer we not know the details of what's going on. Um, and um, is that, in, is, what's your impression of that? Because it seems to be, um, kind of a vague conceptual notion for most people. Well, there may be some truth to that, uh, in part because, uh, at least from the standpoint of the nuclear threat, uh, there's nothing you really can do about it, certainly at an individual level. Uh, you know, diplomats can negotiate arms control agreements. Uh, there are various steps that can be taken to reduce tensions, uh, open hotlines between hotlines. That, there's a hotline, of course, that exists and has existed for many decades between the United States and, and, uh, and Russia. Um, uh, so there are those kinds of confidence building measures that can be taken. But from the standpoint of the individual, they may be aware at some level, 
Uh, of course, there's no surface testing of nu nuclear weapons. In fact, no testing at all right now of nuclear weapons. So other than occasionally by the North Koreans. So, uh, you know, it, it's not something that's in people's consciousness. By contrast, the, 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 glo the global climate crisis is something that's in everybody's awareness. And it is something that people can do things about. They can, they can go to Adam's uh, school and learn skills. Uh, they can, uh, you know, engage in, uh, with not-for-profit organizations, of which there are now hundreds dealing with climate issues. Uh, so it is something people talk about. And because of, the again, all these manifestations that we're seeing all around us, and I didn't even mention sea level rise and, you know, the melting of the, of the polar ice caps and glaciers. Uh, people see it and they want to say, well, what can we do? So I think it's quite different than the nuclear issue in that regard. Interesting. Um, so one, one question I have, though, and uh, Walter, you may be able to speak to this uh, for mid-career military officers all the way through, Adam, to young undergraduate students, the depth and the complexity just of climate change alone in terms of, well, and the nuclear threat as well, how it's going to be very intersectional in terms of its impacts on civilization, life as we know it, our standards of living, uh, it's going to be with us going forward. Um, how deeply do they really understand that? Uh, so I think that uh, we have a general societal awakening about the threat of climate change that um, students and from military officers and, and students in universities realize it through um, the daily news. They uh, realize it through the scientific reports. And we realize that um, climate change requires action. As Adam said, both at the individual level and uh, at the larger level, both national level, and then of course at the international level. So this is a problem that, that it stares us in the face uh, on hot days particularly, but uh, climate change isn't just about global warming. It's also about greater fluctuations in our Earth's atmosphere and in the, the, the geography. If we're talking about uh, huge masses from Antarctica breaking off, um, or we're talking about the earlier threats like uh, holes in ozone layers. These are, um, these are issues that affect people's cancer rates and their uh, prospects for the long term. So yes, it, it is an issue that is complex, particularly the solutions are complex. Um, being trained as a scientist, I tend to think of problem and solution, but the solutions are at many different levels and it has to be a combination of scientific and political. Um, and all of that requires the, the political will to do things. And as we've seen in, in, in elections now in Canada and in last election last year, the United States, the, uh, the climate change is an election issue. It is a matter that people are thinking about as they're going to the uh, ballot box. And also we're in the middle of a uh, uh, national election here in Canada. And it's curious to see how much climate change, you know, it ratchets up each time in terms of the predominance in, in the narrative. Um, there's still other issues though that tend to take predominance. So uh, I think we have to see how that goes. Um, um, Robert, I was just going to, if I may, I was just going to build on a point that Walter just made uh, regarding the role of the military. You know, I learned during my time in, in the Pentagon and thereafter, uh, the, 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 the military, certainly in both the United States and Canada, are well aware of the, the growing threat to their operations posed by climate change. And there's been a lot of papers generated, a lot of thinking that has gone on. Uh, about this. I mean, th just consider, for example, the, the, the threat to naval bases from rising sea levels uh, and how many military uh, facilities, both land and sea, uh, uh, could be potentially affected. Uh, the ability to conduct operations uh, in foreign lands where there may be a uh, very severe climate. Uh, I mean, we already saw the, the uh, coalition forces trying to operate in Iraq uh, you know, setting aside the pros and cons of the Iraqi conflict, but uh, where temperatures were every day well in excess of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this creates all sorts of, of 
problems and challenges for the military. So they are very aware of this. So it's great that Walter's uh, been teaching mid-career uh, military folks in Canada, and there are similar uh, training that's going on in the U.S. Thank you for that. And to go back to uh, another thing that Walter had spoke about um, in terms of, you know, people understanding or the the, stu the student level of understanding. Um, certainly the students who are coming in now have this great disgust with um, our generation. I'm looking around uh, the video here of, um, of, of uh, elderly gentlemen um, and certainly how, uh, you know, I do get the strong message of how dare you and what are we, what are we going to do about it? You know, they really feel the, the students in my classes really feel like that uh, they're there to learn as much as possible so they can go out in the world and challenge the way that we built our society. I'm, everybody, including these students, are always looking for some magical silver bullet solution. You know, um, they really get intrigued by my introduction of all of the geoengineering options, things like putting uh, particulate matter hot into the upper atmosphere or feeding the oceans iron, um, or putting mirrors uh, high up into space to reflect the sun so it doesn't come in directly into, uh, onto the earth. Um, they look for that, that sort of instant solution, um, but they're certainly very wary that you know, humans have, have caused this huge uh, problem of climate change, that they do understand that humans could make things worse by trying to make it better. And looking back in history, I'm able to give some examples of that, how humans don't always have all of the answers. I'm a humanist. I do believe that we are going to get ourselves out of this mess that we put ourselves into. But when I challenge the students to say, you know, um, you know, we've been living in these, this era of plenty. And um, now, uh, you know, our, our livelihoods, our level of uh, luxury that we've lived is now going to have to come down if we're going to solve some of these environmental issues. And uh, the students don't really like that, that we've been out there, you know, having a great time pillaging the... Uh, the environment uh, for our own benefit and economic wealth, um, and now leaving it for them to try and fix up our mess. You know, I, I can understand the finger wagging uh, because at some level, they you could say they missed the party, you know, and their lifestyle is not going to be the same as ours. And I think they know that. Um, do you get senses of depression or um, anything like that? Um, despair, grief coming out of any of these students, knowing that their lifestyle is going to be fundamentally different from what we've seen. Is, does that resonate with any of the students that you're working with? Any, any, any of you? I'm not seeing it at the graduate level. I don't know if Adam's seeing it at the undergraduate, but uh, uh, no, the, people, the students I'm dealing with uh, are trying to figure out solutions and they're not depressed. They're not in a grieving state, they're in a, if anything, they're angry and uh, they want to look for solutions. Um, I just also wanted to react to a point that Adam just made about uh, macro engineered solutions. You know, there's a very interesting ethical debate about that, ethical political. Uh, and uh, we talk about it in my course, which is, you know, if you strive for the magic bullet technological fix, uh, does that relieve people of the requirement to change their behavior? Uh, and uh, I think there's a, that's a very serious question. Uh, and there are many in the scientific community uh, who have felt that we shouldn't emphasize macro-engineered climate solutions, you know, carbon capture solutions and so forth, for, at risk of saying, well, people won't change their lifestyles, their habits, their, their driving behavior, their uh, electrical electricity consumption behavior. Uh, unfortunately, though, with the data coming in about how fast global, the, cl the global climate is warming, uh, maybe that, that ship has already sailed. 
and we have no choice but to start looking seriously at macro-engineered solutions. Uh, and Robert, I would say that uh, the, the generations to come uh, do have an advantage over past generations, the white-haired generation of today. They, um, the longevity, life expectancy is uh, greater now than it was before. Uh, there are so many uh, positive things that are going on on the area of equality uh, and facing those challenges. I think that the next generation or the current one can actually live in a more ethical era and they can take comfort from that, that they can be more concerned about their carbon footprint. They can um, make contributions uh, big and small in ways that, that uh, during the technological era, during the Cold War, when we were preoccupied with the geostrategic rivalry between two um, ideational philosophies and systems, that now there's uh, just a wider range of uh, political expression. And um, it's also a great opportunity to think about uh, global solutions. So, I mean, I, I, am, I wish all the best to, to the coming generations as we try and finish our work uh, creating those global solutions that are required for the global problems that we've been talking about. Interesting. So you could almost say it's the worst of times and it's the best of times yeah. in that sense, because there's uh, uh, certainly more information available, more potential range of solutions, uh, maybe more openness to look at those, uh, possibly more innovation uh, in both the nuclear arena and the climate arena. Um, I can't help, though, uh, Adam, when you're talking about these macro-engineered solutions that uh, um, you help students look at our track record for those kind of things, which is probably pretty abysmal when we get into that, because we always seem to miss all most of the side effects of what a uh, particular solution's trying to target. And, and Mitch, I get your point about changing lifestyle. And at some point, how do we use less energy and less material goods? That was something one of the other thinkers involved in the summit uh, was very big on, is at some point, it really comes down to using less energy and less material consumption. Um, so does that uh, factor in at all with these students? I mean, uh, are they? do you see any of them doing that by choice? Or is it really more just recognizing that it's something that's going to happen? No, I'm, I'm seeing it by choice. Now, that, that may be a, a forced economic choice because they are starving students, um, but they, they do take the, uh, you know, the, the more ethical decisions of, um, you know, of eating, uh, of going vegetarian, certainly a lot more than in my day, uh, but also in all those other aspects of not owning a car, wishing to walk and bike everywhere. But I think, um, I think there's larger ethical decisions that are coming down the road. Uh, Walter brought that to the table here. And if I think of, you know, arguably the, the largest security issue um, that today's generation is going to have to deal with is probably climate refugees. So these are, these are um, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people who are going to have to migrate to... Uh, you know, just to survive because the areas that they're living in right now will no longer be um, uh, ha habitable. And, um, you know, they'll be looking for food, looking for clean water. And Canada's done a good job in the, you know, in the past, in the immediate past of uh, certainly with the Syrian refugees over virtually overnight, we brought in 30,000 refugees. But like I said, you know, when you go from tens of thousands to tens of millions or even hundreds of millions, um, it's almost unfathomable for me to think about those challenges ahead. Yeah, I think the, the estimates I've read are, are, these are UN estimates that could be upwards of 50 million climate refugees a year by the year 2050. If, if, if the t uh, climate, you know, keeps changing at the rate that it currently is. For the, just the reasons Adam said, land becoming uh, un, unfarmable, lack of water, uh, people migrating to cities and migrating to other places. 
That's interesting point from both of you. One of our uh, thinkers that we had involved in a previous uh, Thinkers Lodge event um, uh, uh, runs an organization called Displacement Solutions out of Australia, and they work with governments around the world. Um, and that figure of 50 million, 100 million could easily extend up to several hundred million. And it's really already quite underway in a number of countries around the world. When you look at a lot of the Pacific nations, uh, when you look at uh, Pakistan, India, places like that. And I think even in Canada, we're starting to see a lot of in-migration from people um, that are really uh, seeing areas like Atlantic Canada, other parts of the world as refuge areas on the planet from some of the effects of climate change. And if anything, that's going to, I think, accelerate. Um, I've got a question, uh, one of them coming in from uh, one of our um, audience members. We've got COP26 coming up this fall, shortly after the summit that we'll be having. And that's number 26. Um, so any impressions on what you might be looking for out of COP26? Well, there's some question whether the conference will even take place. Uh, the NGO community in the last week or so has started uh, saying that because of the pandemic uh, and the inability of some people to travel, that uh, they believe that uh, the conference should be postponed. So uh, we'll see. I guess they'll probably have to decide very soon if it will happen or if it's going to happen virtually. And uh, their point, I think, is that if people can't get together face to face, if it has to be virtual like we are speaking here today, that you would have a very different outcome, certainly than you did at the Paris uh, meeting, which produced the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, we'll have to see if that takes place. Um, hopefully it will. Hopefully there'll be a significant outcome. You know, one of our thinkers um, uh, earlier, William Rees, when we interviewed him, pointed out that of the many climate uh, agreements, climate meetings, going back to Kyoto and, and even earlier. Uh, when you stack those up against the CO2 concentration rise uh, in Hawaii, the main monitoring station there, there's no blip based on any of the agreements. So if that's a kind of a measurable um, outcome of, of any of this work, we're not doing very well in that sense. Um, so that's why I think it comes back to the, really the importance of education um, and students. So that's one of the question areas I wanted to bring up is um, how does the work that you do with these different levels of students, how does that translate into action for them? You, we touched on it a little bit, Adam, you mentioned it, and, and Mitch and, and Walter, but if you could say a little bit more, what are you seeing uh, that they're actually doing or planning to do or inspired to do that they're verbalizing, maybe actively making plans? How does that translate if there's any specific examples that you can think of? The students that I'm teaching are, are pursuing professional master's degrees, either in public administration or international affairs. And so they are in a two-year program and then looking to head directly into careers, either in government or with not-for-profit not organizations, sometimes in the business community, but mostly in, in government. So they're, they're looking to jump right in. And... Uh, at this, the local level, in New York City, state, national, and the UN, certainly with the UN headquartered in New York. So uh, uh, I see a real eagerness. I just had a video conference this morning with one of my students who wants to try to develop a career in, on, in working in sustainability. And uh, she was asking me how she could get involved at the, at the local level, in the, at the New York City level in that. And we talked about the things that uh, were raised after Hurricane Sandy with the terrible flooding and the blackout, which I lived through myself, uh, and the, the, the various programs and, and projects that New York City said it was going to undertake to become more resilient 
uh, and yet very few of them have actually been built. So I was saying to her, I thought it was a real growth, uh, growth field for, for young professionals to get into that area. Uh, you know, New York City is going to have to do something about the lower tip of Manhattan. Uh, there's a proposal to build a gigantic buffer, a berm or a wall or something around lower Manhattan uh, to guard against sea level rise. There have been proposals to build barriers uh, at the outer edges of New York Harbor, somewhat like the Thames barrier or the the barrier in Venice, Italy, uh, but that's you know billions and billions of dollars. It would take a decade to build, uh, and it would have secondary environmental effects, which may not be so wonderful. But they, students want to jump into it, and these students are, as I say, are master's degree students who will go directly, hopefully, into jobs in this area. Walter, how about uh, with military students? Do you see? Can you? pull out any examples that might come to mind of where they, uh, with the work that you've done with them on peacekeeping and, and um, even with uh, the nuclear threat, how are they changing their career focus? Are they looking to have more impact in some way? Um, what would come to mind there? Right, I, I wish I had more success stories. I've certainly had students go on to uh, get high places. Uh, about two years ago, the chief of defense staff in Canada uh, called me into his office at National Defense Headquarters, and uh, we discussed the possible contributions of Canada to UN peacekeeping. And uh, as he was leaving, he says, I still remember taking your course in peacekeeping. He said, and I remember getting an A. <laughs> so um, Canada's top soldier had memories, but I can't say that I, that, that we, Canada did much more on peacekeeping. They, they did, sent a medevac and transport mission to Mali, but a lot of what we promised we still haven't delivered. And even in the refugee field, 30,000, uh, which we took from Syria after Trudeau came in, into power, was uh, just a small portion compared to Germany's 1 million that they did in a single year. And so many other areas where I have people from different departments, not just uh, national defense and the Canadian Armed Forces, but we have them from different departments who go on to be deputy ministers and the like. And uh, you hope that, that if they don't uh, pick up on specific things, then at least the approach, the global approach, thinking globally, uh, being concerned about human beings in other countries, not being um, hyper-nationalist and always thinking at things through the selfish national interest, but looking at it through enlightened human interest. Those are the kind of factors that I hope that are instilled. Um, I have had the students who, who went on to become uh, chiefs of their armed forces, um, in, in uh, Caribbean countries and Pakistan. And uh, in fact, we just got a general coming back from Kabul. He had been, uh, he had been a three-star general in, in Afghanistan and, and we, um, we helped him get back to Canada uh, after the uh, takeover, of, uh, the Taliban takeover in, in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but all these individuals, we try and instill not only the knowledge and the skills, but also the attitudes. And attitudes are not just something of the mind, but they're also of the heart. And that, uh, you hope, comes through in the classes. And the very nature of our multinational, we have about 30 countries represented taking uh, courses at the command and staff level, as well as the national security program. And I always emphasize that um, I really admire the students for their um, selflessness, that they have a motto of putting country before self. But I, um, I, I try and hold myself to um, a motto in addition to that, which is um, putting humanity before country. And I hope that they, they keep that in mind as they start to do their activities, that we can really think of the larger humanity. And actually in the long term, that's the best way to secure your national interest and values. That's wonderful. I love to hear what you're saying about that benevolence, that focus on benevolence and really coming from the heart. You know, it reminds me, uh, back when Bertrand Russell, Albert Einstein wrote the 1955 uh, Manifesto, uh, which really started the Pugwash movement, the Pugwash Conference, one of the key phrases was, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And it seems like we really, at the end of the day, it all comes back to that. Um, Adam, I'm yeah. curious at the undergraduate level, um, what kind of inspiration sparks you're seeing coming out of your students, any specific examples in terms of uh, what they're hoping to do coming out of this? 
Well, our program has this horrible name called Applied Climate Change, and, and that's intended for it to be a very practical program so that they develop knowledge and skills uh, that they can take out directly into the field to start, uh, you know, helping organizations and individuals uh, respond to or live with climate change. And, um, you know, we're, we're already seeing uh, so many impacts here on Prince Edward Island with uh, uh, coastal erosion is shrinking our island, uh, you know, as much as five meters of erosion per year in some cottage areas. And, uh, you know, we're getting warmer and drier like most of the other uh, parts of the country. Um, with our sporadic uh, intensive rainfall events, which are washing out roads and bridges. So there's lots to learn and lots to learn how to deal with these, um, these challenges. And so I think uh, almost in that case study approach of seeing what's happening here on uh, Prince Edward Island, it's, uh, we, we call it the, um, the living laboratory here because it's it's large enough uh, to matter, but small enough to um, really study the heck out of it. You know, we look at every single meter of the coastline and track that change every decade. It's, uh, it's, it allows us for, for students to really get a practical uh, knowledge and approach to responding to climate change. So. I'm seeing them wanting to take that back to their home provinces or to their home countries because we do have 30% uh, international students at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, but that's, that's where we're at. We're, we, we have our first graduates would be in the year uh, 2023. So we can't say they've been anywhere yet, but that's where they're headed. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll develop a fantastic track record there. And, you know, I agree with you. It's an absolutely beautiful place, Prince Edward Island. I'm familiar with some of those sea cliffs that you talk about and coastal erosion of that many meters, four or five meters in a year uh, with some of the storms. Um, that must really set some people back, particularly some of the landowners and so on. Um, so, yes, it is kind of a, a good laboratory in that way. It's small enough that you can really study exactly what's going on year over year. Um, well, and even uh, Mitch in New York, you, you forgot to mention Ida recently, Hurricane Ida. And that, again, a strong wake up call for New Yorkers, I would think. Absolutely. The uh, water in the subways and flooding and the roads that uh, and in, in basements that with people living in illegal residences and basements and dozens of people were killed as a result of that. Robert, I just wanted to return for a minute to the uh, question of uh, sort of shift the focus back to nuclear for a minute and, and some of Walter's last comment. You know, the, in my experience, uh, the professional military, and I assume this applies, I know the U.S. military context, Walter can comment on the Canadian. Um, professional soldiers don't believe that a nuclear war, I mean, the, the old Ronald Reagan comment about a nuclear war can never be won and should never be fought. Uh, most professional soldiers believe that. They know what the implication is. Uh, but the reason I, I raise that again now is that, you know, coming back to the point that Adam made earlier about uh, uh, macro engineered solutions to climate change, we are unfortunately on the precipice, potentially, of uh, another round of technological uh, ad advances, and I put that in quotes, uh, on the nuclear side. I'm thinking here of things like hypersonic glide vehicles, uh, which would uh, potentially neutralize uh, anti-ballistic missile defense systems, uh, in fact, all defense systems, um, and uh, uh, nuclear cruise missiles, the Russians are working actively on both of those. Uh, and the question is whether the U.S. will respond or may already be responding. Um, so, you know, if we start a new arms race, a new nuclear arms race uh, at this point, even though we have moved on a long way from the days of the Cold War, you know, where both sides had tens of thousands of weapons, we've built down from that now. Uh, but 
we could see another nuclear arms race. And then that's just between the U.S. The US and, and Russia, potentially China. China also is working on a hypersonic glide vehicle. Um, then factor in the possibility of an arms race in the Middle East between Iran and Saudi Arabia. If Iran does not come back, you know, if the U.S., I should say, does not come back into the into the JCPOA, the, the uh, nuclear agreement, um, because of disagreement with Iran, and Iran breaks out and goes ahead to build a weapon, first of all, the Israelis likely are to respond, will respond, but the Saudis could also respond by investing uh, in the acquisition of a nuclear weapon of their own. So even though the threat seems much more remote and esoteric than the climate threat, uh, the possibility of a new arms race uh, is real. You're right. I've heard it called the modernization of nuclear weapons, which is a scary combination of words just to begin with. Um, but you're right, hypersonic um, and a lot of rebuilding uh, the silos in the U.S., um, reinstalling uh, new missiles, new capacity, that sort of thing. Well, the missiles themselves, of course, are, are, are very aged at this point, and many of those systems have to be replaced if they're to remain reliable. Um, there, you have to draw a distinction between, you know, updating um, delivery systems, which you could argue that this hypersonic glide vehicle is a, would be a new delivery system, versus updating the weapons themselves, and that that's another whole issue, which we may or may not want to get into, but... Uh, the reliability and safety of the of the weapons uh, in the U.S. We've developed very sophisticated uh, computer models, which allow for testing the reliability of weapons without actually testing them. But uh, at some point, the, that that question arises as well. It's really unfortunate that we've never fully realized the what was known as the peace dividend. If you remember back in. 1990, when we had hoped that all of the investments that countries were putting into, into nuclear weapons could be now diverted to more peaceful efforts, but uh, that seemed to quickly disappear. Well, you'll also remember that Reagan and Gorbachev came very close to negotiating the complete abolition of nuclear weapons. But uh, after that summit meeting in Reykjavik, both sides pulled back and it didn't have, never happened. So, yeah, we've been living with nuclear weapons for 76 years now, and they're not going to go away. Uh, one of the other thinkers, um, I think, made the comment that it's a question not of if, but when there's going to be an exchange or an accident of some kind. We've already had too many close calls, even just with accidents. And that's been documented in a number of books. So I've got a question for all three of you. Um, it strikes me that more universities, even into the high school level, science teachers and so on, are feeling a need to bring this out to their students. Students are wanting to learn more about these things. It's really the two most important topics of our age. What are your recommendations to other teachers out there? And I'll throw that out to all three of you who wants to jump in. Robert, um, my teaching philosophy is encourage an, an inquiring mind. Um, and uh, I would, the corollary would be for the take teacher, teach with an open heart. Um, so you try and find out what the students are interested in, try and uh, see what, what fires their imagination and allow them to go with it. Because a, uh, a lot of teaching is about uh, the students finding their own passions, their own interests, and so uh, my, my approach is usually to allow uh, on essay subjects or on uh, research exploration to give a lot of freedom, but at the same time, for those who want more direction, to provide that as well. So really um, help the student discover their own, their own interests and their own um, passion and their own potential. That's great. And give them the resources to go deep in, in to what's important to them because they're there with that motivation. That's fantastic. When I was uh, president of Baruch College, uh, I advocated that every student 
should have at least some exposure to global climate issues by the time they graduated, no matter what their major, what their discipline. Uh, I can't say that I was 100% successful in making that case because uh, the faculty kept saying, well, what would you have us give up in order to have every student be required to take a course in, in, in you know, climate, climate change course? Uh, so we compromised by trying to weave it into existing curriculum. But um, I think as time goes forward, you're going to see this actually getting integrated into secondary school curriculum, too. And I think that's already beginning to happen, uh, that uh, social studies teachers and science teachers are beginning to expose students, uh, maybe even as early as middle school, in, in, uh, to, to some of these issues. Uh, because uh, as we've all been saying, it, it, it's something that people see all around them. They see the effects now, whether it's loss of shoreline or uh, forest burning or, you know, uh, drought and, or too much rain. So um, I think these are issues that will be find their way into curricula, even at the secondary level. Interesting when you say, what would you have us give up? Uh, asking that question instead of saying, well, what's the most important topic? Um, kind of turning it around the other way. Well, it, it, in academia, as my colleagues know, I'm sure, everybody thinks their, sub, their source of course of study is the most important. So uh, that nobody wants to sacrifice their, their curriculum for something else. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a whole new um, discipline of study or uh, area of study that's emerged out of climate change and human health, and it has to do with um, mental health. And that's on two frames. One is um, looking at how, you know, having to deal with these catastrophes of forest fires and flooding events or drought, uh, how that's impacting on an individual's mental health. But there's also this idea of, um, especially with the uh, younger, with youth and with younger students of, uh, you know, ha having these, uh, these ideas of catastrophe thrown at them all the time. And uh, I kind of joke uh, about it in my class because I say, well, this is, this is what's going to make you go home and cry under your pillow at night. But uh, I do have to uh, sort of tone down some of the, uh, uh, some of the presentation that I make uh, just because I can see the horror that does emerge in some of their faces. So even though this stuff is getting into um, into younger and younger age groups, I think there's going to be a demand more and more for us to you know make sure that we can uh, balance it off with some you know uh, some positive news. I mean at least, at least on the beautiful island of Prince Edward Island, you know, there are some positive uh, as well as negative impacts of climate change in the short term. Uh, in the long term, we're, we're all doomed. But in the short term, you know, we can see and, and identify some of those positive aspects. And so that's one way in which I try to balance off some of my doomsday story. Um, uh, but, you know, sometimes reality, you just can't sugarcoat it too much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem important to really lay it out there the way it is, but then also show a way forward. Um, and Walter, I very much like what you said, a way forward with a heart and that benevolence to humanity um, as kind of the leading operative Um and then what you do around that is um, how can you help us adapt as a human experiment uh, in the predicament that we're in, um, each of these students um, in their own way, and build a world that's more suited for longer sustainability um, on the planet that we live on. So I want to thank all three of you. This has been a fantastic discussion. Again, it's been an absolute honor to be able to speak with each of you and have this conversation. Um, I do want to encourage listeners to sign up for our newsletter. It's easy to do on our website. It will keep you abreast of upcoming events related to this summit, 
but then we're already to starting to plan things for next year as well. So it's a good uh, newsletter uh, to stay uh, subscribed to um, and stay abreast of what we're doing. Uh, in terms of upcoming events, uh, we just recently found out, and I want to announce that uh, uh, speaking of presentations to students, we will be at the Pugwash High School uh, in Pugwash. It's two blocks away from the Thinker's Lodge on Friday, October 1st, 1.30 in the afternoon to 2.50. Uh, the public is welcome to attend. Um, we'll have some of our thinkers. We're hoping it'll be primarily the uh, younger thinkers, the youth thinkers presenting to about 100 uh, senior high school students on the nuclear threat and the climate change threat. Uh, we're hoping that will be live streamed. Uh, details are on the website. Uh, stay abreast of those. If you can make it to Pugwash uh, for that event, please do. Uh, you're very welcome. And lastly, I would like to say as well, um, if you're inspired, please make a donation to Center for Local Prosperity, either in the U.S. or in Canada. We can provide a tax receipt. It helps greatly for us to carry on this type of work, um, this summit that's coming up, as well as events that we're planning into the future. So I think we're up. Uh, time is up for this evening. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Mitchell, Adam, and Walter for your fantastic uh, enthusiasm this, this evening uh, for today's discussion, and I'd like to thank everyone that has attended. Thank you.